Welcome to the Arts to Hearts podcast, a show where we take a peek into the hearts and lives of our favorite artists. From running a creative business and practice to mindset, we talk about everything that goes behind into making a life and a career that you adore as an artist. Think of this as your happy hour with your favorite artist in your studio. Hear them share the messy and the wonderful side of creating and living a creative, heartfelt life within and outside our studios. As you tune in, be ready to be inspired and encouraged. I'm your host Charuka Rora, an artist, designer, entrepreneur, and founder of Arts to Hearts Project. Thank you so much for being here. Let's jump right in. Hey, you guys! Welcome back to the Arts to Hearts podcast. This is your host Charuka, and you are here back at Arts to Hearts podcast. If you are a new listener, welcome, welcome to the Arts to Hearts podcast. Here we have transparent conversations, lots of. Um, just just honest conversations with artists entrepreneurs creative entrepreneurs and everyone that is related to the uh, creative field and today i have a very special guest and of course all my guests are definitely special but uh, i'm very excited to have um, someone here today with me for this episode and i want to introduce jen dwyer to you hi jen welcome to the podcast thanks for having me thank you for coming thank you so much so jen is a um i have i've seen jen for over past one and a half year and we've been speaking about and you know growing together we did da- we did a course together and it's been such a it's been such a beautiful journey uh to see jen and what she's been doing i absolutely love her work and she makes these beautiful sculptures which are um she likes to call it babies and that's what i absolutely love jen just introduce yourself and what you do so hi everyone i am jen dwyer i am a ceramic sculptor and a painter i am probably more well known for my sculptures because um i've been doing it for much longer i have multiple degrees in it and basically i've been doing it my whole life um and i'm a self-taught painter even though i've always you know, drawn and painted to some degree. Um, only in the past couple of years have I started kind of sharing my painting. I finished my, I grew up in the Bay Area, California, um, and then went to college and studied art and environmental science. And then um, a few years later, got my MFA at University of Notre Dame. And then after that, I moved to upstate New York to start a fellowship at Wasaya Projects, which kind of manifested into this year long, year and a half long residency. And I really fell in love with the upstate area, like a lot of nature and I'm in the country and I, I love being near water. Um, and so I just bought my first home that I'm turning into a live work studio, um, two hours Northwest of New York city. Amazing. Amazing. And we are definitely going to talk about that. And of course, your new uh, clay class. But before we go on to that part of what you do, let's start from the beginning. And that's absolutely something I love about, you know, having guests on the podcast is to know what made them like what they are, what made them who they are today. So let's talk about where did you grow up? How how was it growing up for you? Did you always want to be an artist? Um, I always loved art. So I have a learning disability and a reading disability. So the academics in school were always really challenging for me. And art was something that came really naturally. And I also am a very like highly sensitive person. And so, um, you know, at a younger age, I didn't know what anxiety and like of things course. like that were. And so art was not only this thing that was, um, you know, really helpful in my confidence at a, at a younger age, because it was something that just like came really naturally to me versus other subjects that were more challenging. But ceramics in particular is a very soothing medium. Um, throwing is something that's used, uh, you know, recommended to people with PTSD. Um, a lot of the like PI veterans in the U.S. after World War II um, got their MFAs in ceramics. And I think I probably like started because, um, it was like this healing medium. So I feel like in high school, particularly, I got really into ceramics. Um, it was so soothing. Um, and then it just, it was something that came 
much more easily than other subjects. So um, did you have anyone in the creative, uh, like a creative influence that made you believe that, or like that influenced you that you could pursue a creative career uh, or that was something that you figured, like, you know, you had to figure it out for yourself or. Yeah, unfortunately the later one, um, <laughs> I, I think like, I'm just kind of naturally stubborn when I, um, graduated college, I did my first residency when I was 23 and I remembered, you know, telling my parents I was going to be an <laughs> artist and they laughed and, um, <laughs> you know, they were, I, I think like now I later, I'm really kind of grateful for their lack of support in a way, because I think it forced me to be really intuitive or not intuitive, really, um, you know, do a lot of research and be really resourceful as to how to pursue this like very unclear path. Um, and so, you know, my dad was, um, essentially like, I love you, but you're really on your own. <laughs> um, and so some girlfriends were moving to Brooklyn when I was 23 and I, I moved with them and I applied for a residency in Brooklyn and an internship. Um, and I think that that was really helpful because I slowly but surely, you know, just started to be in an environment where people are, was their career. And that wasn't like this crazy thing, you know, everyone had to work incredibly hard, but, um, it wasn't like this pipe dream, like people were doing it. Um, so yeah, I think, I think moving to New York City was helpful and although I don't know, I, I, would, I don't want to like give that <laughs> advice to younger artists because I, <laughs> in full truth, I to be like, before I tend to do at night, I taught kids class, I like, you know, carved out an hour for my studio time here or there. I worked seven days a week. Like it was, I don't think the work I made or, um, the lifestyles living for those four years I was in New York City was really healthy or anything like that but it did kind of like plant the seed of like this isn't a crazy dream like it can happen yeah I think because this is this is something that that is for so many of us that uh we like for me I I never even I could never even think of being an artist because I never saw one I always I always thought like creativity mm -hmm. everyone is creative like girls do this boys are athletic and like all of those things but even then subconsciously, uh, I feel like now when I reflect, I was making that effort. I was making that effort to be um, creative in whatever way I could be, even when I thought it couldn't be a profession. Um, with with In this episode, I, it's really important for me to have you here. And I think we spoke about this before we started recording this episode. And I really want to talk about um, in this episode around this idea. You started on your own and you started quite early. You've been in this uh, for a decade. Uh, in the past one and a half year, I've seen you grown so much. And I absolutely love the energy and the work that you do, but also the love that you love for your work. I mean, you can see that, you can feel that. I want us to take you through and uh, talk about how did you, like you've also traveled and, you know, studied in different places. I wanted us to talk about a, how did you start your journey as an artist? And then we'll talk about what you're doing right now. So let's touch upon your, you know, your part of traveling and fellowships and how has that contributed to your growth as an artist today? Um, I think it's been pretty, um, I think residencies have really been a huge part of um, like my career and, and helping it. When I was living in New York city, I just felt like I didn't have the time or resources to, um, you know, spend as much time in the studio as you need to progress. And so in 2016, I, or 2015, I applied to grad schools and I did a bunch of research. I applied to like 12, I think I, got into half of them, got a, a couple more interviews to other ones that I was waitlisted on. Um, and I, I realized like if I was willing to be flexible about where I was living, there, there were a lot of programs that um, were funded and, you know, had really great facilities and professors and stuff like that. So 
Um, I applied to grad school and then I also applied to long-term residency. So the year before grad school, I did a year long residency for like eight or nine months um, in North Carolina. And there they, you know, gave you um, housing and um, a small stipend. And then um, that was kind of the first time that I wasn't bartending, I wasn't teaching. And so that's kind of when I (laughs) realized that like, Instagram could be a helpful tool to continue to share my work, even though I wasn't living (laughs) in a city, I felt it still gave this sense of visibility. Um, Yeah. (laughs) And then also (laughs) I started, you know, selling some smaller works just to help fund the larger works. Um, But yeah, I think residencies are really wonderful for many reasons. Like you meet such, I've made probably my closest friends, other in grad school um through residencies um they give you so much time to just focus on your work um I think it can be pretty hard on your personal life like I've definitely been single for a long time um but (laughs) as far as like your (laughs) that I think that's Um, that's quite a honest uh, (laughs) that's quite an honest feedback and a very uh uh, very needful feedback, <laughs> but that's a great point, actually. Okay, so the, you've you've experienced these different residencies. Also, um, you you were in New York for the past one one and a half year, and now you recently bought your own house, which is amazing. And you know, I know so many women, so many artists who dream of. Uh, first, I think the most, uh, a lot of people just dream about making enough to, um, survive themselves as an artist, uh, to be, um, like a, a person who makes a living with their art. How has your journey been, uh, from someone who started of, with, you know, with no, uh, clarity, uh, you were just figuring it out to now, um, uh, to now, you know, building a, you have a career that's, that's, that's supporting you and you've got your first house with that. Um, so I think it's many things and I feel like in the art Queens, I know that I, there's a lot of, um, conversation about just diversifying. So I feel like that's what I kind of wish I like knew younger and, and would like advise to anyone is, um, just having multiple income streams. So, you know, right now I do smaller works for studio sales and I do larger commissions and, um, you know, working towards upcoming shows, but to have, I think it's having like many different (laughs) creative and I teach a little bit. And, um, so that would be my recommendation because, you know, even like you'll get those large sales, you'll get those commissions and it's exciting, but then it's like the in-between time. Um, I think it's just, at least for my anxiety, I, I think it's a lot more helpful to <laughs> have multiple things all the time. Cause then I feel like my work is a lot stronger, I'm <laughs> not stressed out. And- yeah, of course. <laughs> How was it when you were starting out and, um, you know, the journey of putting your work out there and building like a life, a steady income with the work that you're making? Um, I think it's, I mean, I still, that's nice to hear you say that because I feel like I have these like long-term dreams that I'm like, oh, I'm so far. <laughs> um, but I I think it's like so such a slow, steady <laughs> thing. It's really, <laughs> um, I don't know, it, it's like, slowly but surely (laughs) and that's that's such a nice perspective to have because I think it is easy to um think about like what you don't have versus what you do have um so yeah I mean (laughs) absolutely um I think it's just yeah I guess yeah I think a lot about um when I kind of first started forcing myself to try and use Instagram more and um, you know, only in the past year and a half have I started doing smaller work studio sales. Like it still feels like a very recent thing. Um, prior to that, I had only sold with galleries before and, um, you know, I don't know what else, like done commissions. Um, 
but only in the past like couple years have I been doing it. So a lot of it, I still feel like I'm figuring out. Um, but I, I think just... Of course, you're always figuring it out. Yeah, I think one thing that is really helpful for me in far as growth is not being afraid to dream big and then write those things down because I feel like it is really interesting to reflect back to even a few years ago and then realize, oh, you like so many of those things have come true that um, a few years ago felt like such a pipe dream. And then where you're at now, I think, you know, I think the art queens were all kind of overachievers. Um, but I think it's so easy on a daily basis to be like, oh, my, you know, five, seven, 10 year goals are so far away. Um, but then to take kind of inventory and realize that something you, that you thought was impossible, like five years ago, you've now created. That's true. Actually, that's true. Sometimes we just, um, in the hurry of what we want, where we want to be, sometimes, uh, we forget to appreciate where we are today and how far we've come. Uh, it's not only about going forward, but it's also about knowing where we've come from, how we've built ourselves, what, what it took. And that actually is, that is the whole point. I mean, that is the whole journey. Um, I really want to talk about your work and, you know, like sculpture is a is a very different medium. I mean, um, paintings is more common, more approachable. Um, there's a lot more information. Um, I have never done a sculpture. I don't know. I just want to know more about uh, how was it when you started out as as a sculpturist? Um, well, I I think clay is such a you know, obviously I'm biased, but it's such a beautiful medium. <laughs> um, it's so tactile. <laughs> and literally anyone can do it. Like, I do think it's less intimidating in some ways because, you know, you can take a chunk of clay, squish it in your hands and ostensibly have a sculpture. Versus painting, I think, you know, maybe Western art history has kind of taught us, you know, to be a good painter, it must look like X, Y, and Z. Um, versus ceramics in particular, um, it feels like there's a lot more freedom that can it can really be anything. Um, but I guess to answer your question, like how I kind of got into it, I I fell in love with it first because of throwing. Um, I really I love the wheel. I make many many of my sculptures on the wheel. Um, it's something that I like half. I, I can't like not do it. And so can you, can you talk about what your work is about and what, what kind of work do you make? Yeah, definitely. Um, so all of my work for as long as I can remember has, you know, just been about female empowerment, um, working through, you know, plenty of my own lived experiences, um, as well as, in is particularly in the past couple of years, really wanting to reflect and bring in a lot of art historical moments that I feel like are really um, pertinent in my work. Um, oh God, I feel like I work on so many different bodies of work to, so to try and summarize it all. <laughs> um, I guess what I've been thinking about this, this feeling of um, wanting to enjoy and experience like joy and pleasure, but what kind of happens when that goes to the nth degree and you're kind of like stuck in this fantasy or escapism space and then how that can kind of um, become an, an addiction in a way. So I think anything can be addictive. You know, I love <laughs> to run, but you know, you, you can certainly overexercise. Um, so I, I, I think about that a lot of like how we deal with these kind of like coping mechanisms for the mundane parts of life. Um, but then when, what kind of happens when it, if, if it comes like all consuming. Um, so I feel like a lot of my work has this very like escapism quality. Um, but I, I do hope it comes across that there's a, like, there's a critique as well of, um, you know, uh, what can happen when it's like too much. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you started, you make these beautiful uh, vases um, and which are, which has these, these very signature figurines that you make, the woman with the belly and the braided head. 
um let's talk about how did how has that come into your work and when did you start making and what what does the signify that for you yeah so there's hundreds of these uh paleolithic you know goddess figurines um and they i think they're more iconic and more known to be these fertility figures, but more um, recent research and theory is saying that they were thought to be sculpted by the original artists. So I love to think about them as a motif for the original female gaze, the original self-portrait um, that a female made of herself. And that's why in this article I was reading in school, that's why their bodies are so um, unproportional because before mirrors, that's how women saw themselves looking down. So mm -hmm. I love them for that reason. I also think it's interesting to think about our history and ecology, and especially in that time period, you know, no one can completely prove what they actually were used for. So I think that creates a sense of imagination as well to um, imbue your own narrative and, you know, kind of create these stories for them of, of what, mm -hmm. who they were and what they were doing. And that's, that's very interesting. And now that you're saying that, you know, I honestly did not know about this side of your work or the thought process. And it's very, it's so good to learn more about that because every time I see your work, it brings me so much joy because it looks so beautiful. I think I am still so obsessed with this image of, you know, the dinner table, like it looks like a dinner table set up that, you know, you have those candle stands, those vases and like those porcelain, like those beautiful colors and the, then you make those knuckles and I feel like there's this beautiful integration of um, art but also utility and like how you can how how the work that you're making is not something only that I can maybe just hang on the walls but it becomes a part of a life like you know um, that that also provides me some kind of value uh, was that something yeah. like when when you were and I think this is something that a lot of us a lot of artists deal with uh, you know because art is something that it has to be um, you know there's there's a lot of stereotypes and information that keeps floating around uh, did you did you were you always making this kind of work when you started especially while you were learning in college and then all of that if not what kind of work were you making and um, how did you land up to this one? Um, so I started, I was making sculptures in college and then after college and only in the past couple of years, I started making more functional quasi functional work. And it started because I was researching the 18th century of porcelain. And it was this, you know, it was this fetish in Europe. They were just trying to copy Asia because they were so obsessed with what they were making. And trying to figure out their exact, you know, kale and porcelain recipe. Um, and so I was looking at a lot of these Rococo objects and they're very, and I, I think the reason I also love Rococo is because I think it's interesting to think about the fetish of porcelain and how that contemporary fetish, the female body, try and draw a parallel. Um, but in the, um, the Rococo aesthetic, it, these, a lot of things are functional. So there's porcelain figurines, but there's a lot of vases and urns and candelabras and, um, you know, dishware. Um, but they're still all, you know, like they're at the time it was like this, um, status symbol of wealth. It would, it would be like a designer handbag. Today. So, but then today, when we see these Rococo objects, they're very gaudy. They're pretty hard on our modern eye. So I also think about the ways that value, like tastemakers assign value to things or objects or gender bodies and how that really shifts over time. And you know, today, I think it's helpful to think about things that are of high value, um, but then how that can essentially be kind of arbitrary value and change over time. That's, that's very insightful, actually. What has been, uh, this is something again, you, you are, okay, I will take it into two parts. What has been your biggest fear uh, as a sculpture artist, like as a sculpturist? Um, like we all come with our own sets of um, limiting beliefs that, you know, that either 
are given to us by people or we pick up on the ways what was your biggest fear when you were when or even if it's today whatever you feel comfortable sharing with us um as as a sculptor i think back to when i was 3 and being like okay i'm done with college this is all i can think about and all i want to do how do i figure this out um and i think now and it's you know still always an evolution still trying to like go to the next level and figure it out um but i do think just having uh, a diversity of um income so it's not all based on that one commission or not all on that one gallery show but there are a variety of things that can support your career did you have like um, any inhibitions or limiting beliefs when it came to the kind of work that you were making because of course that's again something that we all deal with because if there's someone who makes like the realistic paintings they're like oh why like why am i not making the other one why am i not a... abstract artists have other like we are we all think like what we are doing and someone else is doing um maybe better or like we all have our own sets of limiting beliefs when it comes to making our own work um what were the limiting beliefs that you had um when you started making your work and is there something that you still are dealing with um definitely dealing with it with painting i feel like cuz i've been doing ceramics for a while and i feel more <laughs> confident um but i would say that i just you know, being a recovering people pleaser, I think, especially in my twenties, <laughs> I was always like, well, will they, will they like my work? Like, is it too feminine? Is it too this? Is it too that? Like, is it, is humor bad? You know, um, does it come off like not academic enough? I had a lot of insecurities. And then my first year of grad school, I, I went to a very challenging grad school. I, um, you know, I learned so much about life, but I, I, there really wasn't a lot of, um, support in a way that I really yeah. needed. <laughs> um, <laughs> but my first year of school, I just felt like, you know, I was, I had these terrible critiques and nothing, no one, it seemed like no one was excited about my work. And then, so I feel like at the end of my first year, I was kind of like, fuck it, I'm just going to make what I want. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, forget you guys. And then that's kind of, I um, started really like um, trying to connect with people outside of my grad school. I started doing FaceTimes with curators in New York City. I started, that's when I applied to Crate Magazine in 2017. Um, I really just started, I was getting zero validation from my <laughs> MFA program. Which, you know, I, I know, it's not their job to say like, oh, good job, like pat you on the head. I know it's their job to, you know, be critical, yeah. but um, I just felt like it was like being like toxic. Um, and um, that's something that a lot of, lot of, of people lot in of the creative world do. Well, <laughs> kind of toxic. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I was kind of like, you know, if I'm not going to really get the support or feedback or help that I need from my program, I'm going to kind of take it upon myself to connect with curators that are excited about my work and can give me some like helpful feedback. Um, and also, you know, have my work in publications um, that is excited about my work. And um, and I think that was really, really helpful um, to see that there's this whole world outside of my um, MFA program that was excited about my work. And, um, and I think it also helped me realize that not everyone's going to love your work and that's normal, but some mm. people are going to love it and some people may hate it. But um, to really just invest and focus on building like your community. And I think that was helpful. Okay. So my question to you is, and it, it's something, it's a, it's a tackle most of most artists have. You went the traditional road. You, you did your MFA, you've done your graduation, you've worked with galleries. You know, you've done what mostly people, you know, a successful artist or the success formula for what we term as success um, entails. But um, then I've seen you taking up this, this space that you own, uh, the digital space, showing up and taking that, you know, taking the career, the whole of your own career in your own, own hands, also representing your own work. 
um how has that journey been for you and um from that to this and it's not like either this or that it's of course a combination of both but i know it takes a lot of effort mentally uh for artists uh for us to accept that what people promote or like what's published is a picture of what an actual artist is versus what is the reality today how has that been for you i mean it's still it's a very new journey and i think it's something that i'm still figuring out still you know <laughs> have insecurities and building confidence um, but i think you know so a year and a half ago during the pandemic i was um let go from my day job and so i just i needed to figure out bills to pay and so i started doing studio sales and um i remember the and i have you know i'm i'm pretty prolific and so i have these little um figurines and i started um just making them available on instagram and on my website and i remember the first one i sold i was like this feels illegal like i'm not selling it to a gallery like am i doing something wrong and i think it just kind of forced me to help thinking like why not why um you know why not kind of like like things are changing there's no set rules um i don't know kind of try things and see what fits and what works and now i'm kind of I have a show coming up in 6 months so now I'm in this time of making larger works which I feel excited about um but I think just kind of trying to you know think outside the box and not um say like this is the one way to do everything cuz I I think that it is um and that's a belief I had for a long time that's still something that I am like constantly working through like by no means do I have it all figured out. I'm definitely like still trying to figure it out. Um but I think just not being afraid to like question like why not? Let me see if this works. Let me, you know, why not see if I can sell some smaller works that can help fund some larger works and um and it also is really nice to connect with people too. It it feels so good when people, you know, tag me in their stories with the the little guys I sell. that's true i think there's also uh, there's i think that's this idea that we're always that we're mostly sold that we have to be either this or that um it doesn't have to be that way we could be a mix of both and there could be a season for any time i mean at some point you would want to um, take things in your own hand kick start and not wait for an opportunity and when you have opportunities you know that your effort could go into a different direction than where it was going maybe um a couple of months ago which comes to my next question is recently you started uh, you expanded your horizon and you opened doors to something called clay class would you like to talk about that i love teaching it's definitely i think it's an a pretty inherent part of um the ceramics kind of community it's it's very common in a ceramic studio there's communal tables there's a lot of information sharing um i love ceramics but it is so thing easy for things to blow up or crack or break and so i think it's just a really common practice um in the form of ceramics for it to be this very collaborative information sharing um you know medium and so yeah. uh being setting up my own studio working alone i was i was just really <laughs> starting to miss people really i I've, i've always enjoyed teaching i think it is really hard to be a full-time educator and a full-time artist and so you know i have chosen the the full-time artist as my focus um but or for my career but i i really miss that part of teaching and so you know being able to do a clay ca- clay class um every so often i think right now i'm i'm going to probably do it three times a year um for six weeks uh and then also i have the recorded version as well but it's giving me a sense to be able to connect with people to be able to share knowledge and and it's exciting too to see uh students that have never worked with clay before and how quickly they can progress yeah yeah i've seen i've seen anna do such beautiful works cat makes such beautiful sculptures and they look like of course i always love what you made but it's so amazing to even see how you are now helping people um with your own skill sets to learn something new and um introduce another medium to uh, to artist art into enthusiast or just people who are just interested in trying another medium 
and it is something that um like you know i and i want to talk about this because i know this happened that you had um a few inhibitions when you were thinking of doing this can you talk about what those fears were and how did you overcome that i think the biggest fear was the fear of technology um i think that you know i i trust that i'm a good educator i i've seen my students work grow i you know i um i really enjoy working with other artists um but it was definitely the how do i even start this will anyone sign up um you know is it going to translate the same online and i think i feel like you know you read all the the books and everyone says just start just try and that is literally like i think cat said that to me so many times like just put it out there um and i think that's like the advice i would give is um you know, like you have this idea, if you can't stop thinking about it, like you at least owe it to yourself to try to put it out there. Um, and it's, you know, it's still in its like, kind of like incubation beginning stage, but it's been really wonderful to work with people. And um, yeah, it, I, I really love it. It's bringing me a lot of joy and um, it seems my students are enjoying it too. Amazing. As viewers also, we're enjoying it too. And if you've not uh, checked out yet, or if you don't know about um, Jen's Clay class, you should go definitely check out. Um, you can find the links also in the show notes. I will add Jen's work and the access and the links to Clay class so that you can access that. Uh, Jen, I want to say a big thank you for being so kind and warm and for being so honest and sharing things with us. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you and I am so excited now to go to the most favorite part of this interview, which is more like a conversation, um, is the rapid fire. So are you ready? One thing that you want to convey through your work in the arts. Female empowerment. <laughs> What's that one word that describes you the best? <laughs> Sensitive, hardworking, playful, I don't know. <laughs> Tall. <laughs> If you could have a studio anywhere in the world, where would it be? Yeah, I, I can hear you. New York City, Paris, LA, San Francisco, and the country. <laughs> Your biggest source of inspiration? Um, other women that have gone through challenging times and kind of seeing them come out on the other end and then and hearing them talk about their struggles, um, it, it's so inspiring to kind of see where people are at now and then understand their journey and it just I find it so um empowering and inspiring and your favorite women artist oh the first artist I really like fell in love with and just had this deep obsession um uh was Francesca Woodman she's the daughter of a very well-known ceramic ceramic artist um Betty Woodman but her, I remember when I first saw her photographs, I was just like, oh my God, my whole heart. Um, and then I feel like, you know, there's plenty of others, but that's really like the first artist I remember being obsessed with. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to check her work out and I'll link um, her work in the show notes. Who's your go-to person when you're in trouble or in need of advice? I have a handful of like five girlfriends that I are just like my family. I, you know... Um, I talk to you all the time. I just, um, Lizzie um, from the Art Queens has become one of them. <laughs> I feel like her and I, like, we've never met, but we talk all the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I always, you know, I, I love my family with all my heart, but I am just such a sensitive people I really need. Um, I, I think I need more than my parents, like, knew how to <laughs> do. And so I feel like yeah. my <laughs> girlfriends have always been like, Absolutely. my soul, my family. <laughs> no absolutely that's true we all need them we all do and shout out to lily because she's an amazing friend and i'm so glad to know that we share that in common can you share like one moment is any out of many that that just makes you feel like at that moment you felt like you were so you were, you were so grateful to be an artist that you took this leap of faith and you chose to be what you wanted to be any one incident any any anything that you would want to share I think the other night I was hanging out with some friends. Um, this was just last weekend and I was just, you know, I don't, I don't drink and they, uh, we were at a restaurant. It's kind of like a bar restaurant and um, they're really incredible painters. And I was just drawing them. And then we each 
they were like, oh my God, let's play a game. Let's do like five minute figure drawing. And then the whole night just turned us as like eating and they were drinking and I was drinking water and drawing. And it was just, it was such an amazing night. And so I think that at that night I was like, I just, you know, this, I'm like living, like spending time with these incredible artists and, um, you know, having such a good night, like doing what I love with people that are wonderful. But yeah, it felt good. I think, um, I feel like so much of being an artist is like spending time with other artists feels really special. I, I so, I so agree to that. And I think you are really fortunate that I feel like I'm still craving for that experience every day, um, even now. I mean, of course, I have all of you beautiful uh, people and like the whole community and everything. But even then, I, I just can't wait for a day where I can actually sit. We can like sit in real and like have that time. I mean, how wonderful would that be? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to like, you know, I live in like an hour away from most of my friends. So it's like on the weekends I see them, but you know, Monday through Friday, it's alone in the studio. Um, so I, yeah, I think <laughs> I, yeah, I, just, I think that's something that everyone's like. If you were to meet younger Jen today, what advice would you give up? Oh my God. Chill out and have more fun. I was, I mean, I, I definitely am a very sensitive person, <laughs> you know, have anxiety and I'm an overachiever. And so um, put a lot of pressure on myself. But I think about when I was in my early 20s and just how hard it was to really be present with friends. And, you know, of course, this is something I'm like still practicing. I'm not great at it. Um, but I just, I remember just saying no to everything um, just because I was like so stressed out about <laughs> what I was doing with my life. Um, so I think today I feel like you know, very much a work in progress, but being able to leave the studio and have a dinner with friends um, and just like enjoy being there with them feels really special. Amazing. And that truly really is true. That's such a great advice. And we all, I think it's not only you, we all need to take that advice for ourselves. Okay. Um, Jen, I just want to say a big thank you for being so kind and for your patience and for all the horrible internet issues that we've had. Uh, I really, really appreciate your time and everything that you've shared with us and it's it's truly so wonderful to have you here before i let you go i just want to ask you if there's something new that's coming up if there's something that you want to share with our listeners that you know they can they would you would want their support how can they support you where can they find you and if there are any last words that you would want to add yeah um so i am gonna have my all live play class will be um we'll start thursday september 16th and registration for that closes on september 9th um you can find that at teachable.playclass um, or on my instagram and then as far as my own work i have my first solo show coming up um in manhattan new york in winter of 2022 um so that's kind of what i'm working on now and then um, some larger commissions. Um. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, guys, you should and you have to definitely check out uh, Jen's clay class. Um, I've been eyeing that for myself and I would definitely recommend if if you wanted to try the medium and if you've seen Jen's work already, um, it's something that's worth, worth giving it a try and checking out. So I will also link... Uh, Jen's work, uh, the link to the click class and everything else in the show notes so you can find everything there uh, also Jen whenever you're ready, whenever your show is ready, please please make sure that you send us the information so that we can help you spread the word and I'm sure that there would be so many people who would love to see what you're doing and we would love to uh, cheer for you, root for you and you know just be there for you Amazing, thank you so much Thank you. Thank you. I hope you have a good day. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You can find all the details and links mentioned in the show notes of this episode available on www.arts2heartsproject.com. And if you like this episode, please don't forget to tag us in your stories and leave us a review here on iTunes or any of your favorite platforms. It really helps us to keep the show going. Thank you so much. I'm sending you lots of love and I can't wait to be back here soon again.
बाय